Ali from Pristine Paradise Palau. We Palauans understand the importance of protecting our natural environment and resources and have been doing so for many generations through the application of our traditional customs of conservation. But while we are a small island nation with minimal impact to the environment, we are the ones who are highly impacted by the effects of climate change. Our people and future generations of Palauans are on the front line of the climate crisis. And for us, the consequences of the actions of much larger nations is disastrous. Palau is doing its part to combat climate change through ensuring 80% of our EEZ is a fully protected no-take zone, also requiring visitors to adhere to the Palau Pledge they signed in their passport upon entering Palau, and by creating a carbon calculator for visitors to offset their carbon footprint while they stay in Palau. We need more countries to help us combat climate change before our country and our culture is decimated forever. We need the help of the world, especially from the large developed countries at COP27 who are responsible for so much of the damage that's affecting our island home. The time has passed for talking and strategizing. We need action now. We ask for your partnership on this journey to heal our planet and protect our home before it is too late. Gong Mal Masula. And that does it for the opening, perhaps a, a round of applause for the lady who's spoken to us um, from Palau. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the 20th Berlin Climate Talks. I was going to say, as we do where I come from, I wish you a warm welcome. But I think with the heat that we've all experienced today, that would be very inappropriate. So here's a cool welcome uh, from me to you this evening. My name is Christine Mundwa, and as Adora was speaking there from Palau, I could resonate. I come from Zimbabwe, and we too are feeling the impact of climate change. But my heart, here goes another one, is warmed. When I think about the fact that there are people in countries like Germany and other places who are gathered about to find solutions, not so much that we help each other or help other people, but that we come together and bring the solutions uh, that we need. So today we're talking about the road to COP27. The road to COP27, climate justice from Petersburg to Sharm El Sheikh. We're excited as Africans and uh, my uh, brothers, I will say, from Egypt will be talking to us a little bit later, but we're excited as Africans to be hosting this COP27 summit. I'm sure many of you are in this dialogue. You might have heard people from my part of the world say, we're left out from the conversation. So for this summit to be coming home to us is something that means a lot to us, especially because the climate crisis is existential for some of us. Our li a way of life is changing. It's urgent for us. And I hope that that sense of urgency comes through as, as we talk today in the run-up to this all very important summit that will be held in Sharm El Sheikh. I don't want to waste any more time, and I'd like to invite Dr. Christiana Averbeck, who's going to do some introductions and welcome us all. Here she is. Yeah, it's a, a challenge now. We are so used to online uh, platforms and uh, discussions that we are not used anymore. I would like to welcome our guests and participants on site and online um, to our 20th Berlin uh, Climate Talk on the road to COP27 climate justice from Petersburg to Sharm El Sheikh. Now, uh, I would like to welcome the Honorable Jennifer Morgan and Norbert Gorison. They are not in the room at the moment, but uh, I know that they will join us in uh, some minutes to come. So, uh, therefore, I have the honor now to welcome the Excellencies, Ambassador Tawail 
Abul Magd, Special Representative for COP27, President Designate. I would like to welcome His Excellency uh, Ambassador Mohamed Nasr, uh, Lead Negotiator and Head of Climate, Environment and Sustainable Development Department of the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you here. Then I would say uh, I also welcome the most respected Christoph Bals, Policy Director, German Watch, member of the Speaker Board of Climate Alliance uh, Germany and the most respected Dr. Camilla Bausch, uh, Scientific and Executive Director of the Ecologic Institute. Thank you so much for the Egyptian Embassy uh, in Berlin for the constructive collaborate, uh, co collaboration in organizing this event. And also thanks uh, to our member organizations uh, for their cooperation and uh, for the organization. This is the Environmental Justice Foundation, Fair Trade Germany, German Watch, the Catholic Rural Youth Germany, LIFE, Miserio, Oxfam Germany, Women Engage for a Common Future, and uh, WWF Germany. Yeah, uh, we heard it already, 40 degrees in Germany, and it will become even hotter. Not only the area around Berlin is drying, uh, in southern Europe forests are burning. And not only on Palau, but also in this Part of the world, we are experiencing the climate crisis. We are touching the planetary boundaries. I had the opportunity to travel with our foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, and uh, I had the opportunity to see with my own eyes how the people of Palau are confronted with the climate crisis. Addressing the people of Palau, Annalena Baerbock promised to support them minimizing the impact of the crisis on their lives and, that's what she said, to help them deal with the damage that's already been done, sometimes irreversibly. It was a strong statement of our foreign minister, as it was the first time that a government representative of a Western country made such a promise that the highly disputed issue of loss and damage was addressed in such a way. She furthermore stated that with COP27 ahead of us, Germany wants to intensify the cooperation with Palau in the high ambition coalition to keep 1.5 degrees in reach. So during the Petersburg uh, climate dialogue, Chancellor Scholz has highlighted the aim of climate neutrality. But, and that is the problem, he did not address how to reach it. And so, we as German civil society, we want not only to hear warm words, we want to see action. So that is also what we expect from the Egyptian COP27 presidency. So you might wonder, who is we? Who are we? Uh, we are uh, a civil society organization. Climate Alliance Germany comprises of 150 civil society organizations with a background of environment, development, faith-based organizations, health, welfare organizations, and trade unions. We say that we can reach out to 25 uh, million uh, people in Germany through our members. And we are a part of a worldwide network of civil society organizations of the Climate Action Network Europe and the Climate Action Network uh, International. So I would say we are a strong force. We are not only advocating for more climate ambition, but we are also the force behind the needed transformation of society. Um, government cannot do it alone. Only through participation of a strong civil society, a climate just world that is highly needed is possible. So I'm therefore glad that today we have the opportunity to discuss with representatives of the Egyptian COP27 presidency and the German government the road to COP27 
Climate Justice from Petersburg to Sharm El Sheikh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Averbeck. And uh, without uh, wasting any more time, I'd like to now invite uh, Ambassador Weil Abumacht uh, to the podium to present for us the priorities of the Egyptian presidency of COP27. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much, Dr. Averbeck, Christina, for the introductions. First, let me start by apologizing for being a bit late. We were uh, talking to New York, the General Assembly, and ECOSOC had a session where we needed to speak about COP27 in Africa. So again, apologies for that. Number two, our delegation is always gender balanced. So, but on this occasion, either they left already for Cairo or they got a deserved day off. So two points before I get into the substance. But uh, thank you, thank you so much. It's indeed a pleasure to be here to share with you our priorities and, and how we see our vision for a successful COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. I'll jump into the matter as fast as I can, not to, how much time, five, seven minutes maybe? Try to keep it within that. Okay, first and foremost, we have stressed from the moment that we were uh, officially uh, the incoming presidencies that now is the time for implementation. We've spent many, many years, of course, throughout since 92, and you had the UNFCCC, and then you had Kyoto and the Doha Amendment, and then you had Paris. Since Paris, 2015 up till now, six years negotiating the Paris Agreement were a program. So that's good and well, that's the legal structure that everybody has to follow, that has more or less the commitments and, and contributions countries are going to be making, but now is the time to implement. It is the expectation, it is the expectation of peoples, it is what science tells us must start now. So when we say implementation, on the one hand, of course, it's implementing the legal agreements, the, the Paris Agreement in, as such. You have the NDCs. Egypt has submitted its updated NDC. We're proud of the new NDC. Uh, and we urge many countries, I, I'm not sure, maybe 15, 17, 18 countries have already done that, but we're stressing and pushing for more NDCs to show more ambition to move forward. And when we say new NDCs, that means cross the board. It means on the mitigation side, but also on adaptation action and finance and, and other means of support for developed countries, uh, committed, f fulfilling their contributions on that side. But it also means another side, which is the here and now, not just a commitment in an NDC. Um, it means implementation on the ground through specific initiatives. As you've seen, many of you, I'm sure, have attended COPS and, and are aware how they work. You have the intergovernmental side, which is the negotiations for those bureaucrats negotiating the text, but you have the rest. It's grown and morphed into much more than just an intergovernmental conference as you have on disarmament or the WTO. It has a bigger involvement of stakeholders. And we'll get to that. Ambassador Nas will sp speak a, a little bit after about Egypt's initiatives and thematic days and, and some of the practical things we're doing on the ground in preparation for COP27 at and after COP27. And before, not to preempt his, his brilliant presentation, I'll just say that our threshold for meaningful implementations has always been it has to be something meaningful and that will sustain and be there next year. Because we don't want photo ops where big you know, things are launched and words are said and then only to be forgotten. We've seen that and we don't want to spend our time, your time and others money and effort just to see something that was, you know, with heads of state or whatever, and then it doesn't get carried forward. So implementation means the, the agreement and the legal side, but it also action on the ground in a broad array of issues. Um, we are also very, very keenly aware that science tells us we have a deficit on every front of action. If we're talking mitigation, keeping 1.5 alive and all of that wonderful stuff, we know there is an obligation, but we're not on track. So whatever it is, without excuses, we need to do more on the side of mitigation. When you look at, at adaptation and look at uh, the science that's out there, uh, Working Group 2 report, a devastating testament to the situation. I should say if someone from a developing country, our friend Christina from Zimbabwe and the African delegates and other representatives I just spoke to, we didn't need the science to tell us. We are living this. We have been living this. You go to the farms, you go to the Nile Basin and the Delta and, and parts of uh, South Asia or Latin America and the Caribbean. The devastation is here. It's now been substantiated by science, good and well, but we've been living it and suffering through it. So on adaptation, the science tells us there's a terrible deficit and we're reaching a point where 
whatever we do, we might not reverse the negative impact. So that's another deficit. And then you have the finance deficit. And I mean, I, I need to be completely honest. When we speak of the $100 billion, that's a fictitious number. I don't know where it came from. It came, someone came up with it, but it is completely detached from the reality and the actual needs. So it's good and well. We hope to reach it. We hope to see it delivered. And there are valiant efforts. And I see Jennifer. I need to watch my words. Now she's in the room. <laughs> no, because Germany and Canada are taking the lead in trying to report to everyone on the update on the $100 billion. And, and we need to give credit where it's due. It isn't easy to come up with taxpayer money. And the needs are very, very, very large. All the figures out there talk about hundreds and hundreds of billions for every sector, let alone for the totality of climate finance. Um, and no one has the ability, no government in any developed country has the ability to you know, write a check for whatever amount to meet the needs. But I'm just describing the status quo, the situation we're at right now. But Germany and Canada are going to present in COP27, perhaps before that, an update report on the efforts to achieve the 100 billion, which has now been moved to 2023 as the target. So hopefully, maybe before that, but, but we'll take whatever uh, they present to us later. So we have the mitigation uh, gap, you have the adaptation gap, and you have the finance gap, and we've always known about those. But loss and damage has been, for those who've been involved in the process, are aware that it didn't get the attention it deserved over the years. And this is completely unfair. And in Glasgow, there was a sense of frustration, particularly among countries in small islands and other parts, also in Africa and others, but particularly those who get hit repeatedly with increasing frequency and severity of these extreme weather events that literally wipe communities off of the map. And, and it is devastating. And we see it in the news, and then we forget about it two days later. But these are livelihoods, people's lives who were lost and their livelihoods who've been devastated. And, and, and I know the world is, is not the same. Not everyone has the same level of resilience to deal with these extreme weather events. So, Unfortunately, the perpetuation of the current status quo will leave people who will continue to be devastated, whereas more developed countries will have the ability to sustain more things. And just look at any one of those extreme weather events that happen in the southeast of the United States, and we hear it on the news because it makes news because two people died and we, we regret their death. But that very same weather event will wipe a quarter of a population of a small island state the same way. It just shows you the discrepancy in the ability to sustain that kind of event. So the losers, despite not being any of contribution of any significance historically or even currently from those small islands, they're the ones hit most. And it goes to your word, climate justice. And we'll get to that in conclusion. So, so this is loss and damage. I'm just trying to touch real quick on the, the main issues that we have a responsibility and, and will aspire to make progress across the board on all of these issues. But the presidency doesn't have a magic wand. It is, at the end of the day, a multilateral process and requires the you know, 180-some countries coming on board. And unfortunately, and I'll conclude with that, before last <laughs> issue, which is the adversarial atmosphere that we all work in, and, and it is not helping anyone. But so these are the main issues that we'll be focusing on, and we have an obligation. It's not a choice, it's not the presidency's choice to focus on these issues. We would be failing in our duty if we said we're going to prioritize. So uh, lost my train of thought. Anyway, uh, so these are the issues. It's not a choice. It's not a priority. This is what we have to do. We can't say we're going to do number one and two and not do three and four. We have an obligation as a presidency, as does every presidency, to push forward to the maximum on each one of these issues. Naturally, issues such as adaptation, particularly for our continent, are an expectation that we're hearing day in and day out from African countries. They feel it has been neglected, despite the general perception for the layperson that Glasgow made great breakthroughs, and it did in many areas, and we give due credit to the UK for the work they did. But at the end of the day, there was a sense that adaptation got a process. We are, what you got in, in Glasgow was the launch of a process, a two-year process, to define and understand what the global goal of adaptation is, which is asked for in the Paris Agreement, by the way. So 
Whereas on uh, the mitigation work pro program, you have a one-year mandate that is very well defined, and mitigation by its very nature is easier to understand and grasp. It's figures and numbers, but adaptation is livelihoods and it's cross-cutting and it covers every many, many, many aspects of people's livelihoods and, and economic activity. So we need to sort of not catch up with the progress on our mitigation, but we need to push forward on all these issues. So I want to wrap up, and there are many issues maybe we'll get to later in the, in the conversation, but um, with two points. So we don't see that it's all gloom and doom. We Work has been done, and progress has been made. It's never enough. It will not be enough, so please don't interpret anything I'm saying as that we've, we've achieved any, any of our objectives. But the reality is, especially, if, like I can use Egypt as an example, the benefits that we got from hosting the COP, it's a lot of money spent and a lot of sleepless nights. But awareness in Egypt is in a very different place than it was ever. It's in the media, youth are mobilized from Aswan to Alexandria, across the country. The media is, is very, very active, uh, civil society organizations, even financial institutions, because we have the COP. So with awareness, you have a constituency like this one that pressures decision makers and in effect, makes them taking the hard decisions easier. If you don't have this type of constituency, it will be very difficult for a government to prioritize climate action over building a new school or a sewage system here or there. So this is one benefit. But across the globe, you have other benefits, including MDBs. Now there's everyone, we are members and contributors to various multi uh, development banks. And there is a willingness to direct more funds to climate. Even corporate banks are going green and trying to fund more uh, sustainable activities. Um, the race to net zero and that type of activity is gaining ground and moving forward. Um, youth, youth, youth. They're all over in Egypt, amazing work being done, and you'll see we have a multiplicity of events and organizations working together to make sure that the voice of youth, they are more idealistic, more noble, and more committed, and they believe in justice. And that's something that, that is much needed in this process. So civil society organizations' activism is essential, and there is a role for them, absolutely, because they are the stakeholders. When we talk about implementation, governments negotiate, but the implementation is sectors of the economy. So all stakeholders have to be there Voices have to be heard because we're not going to implement alone as governments. Other positive developments is drops in prices of technology. This is something that is a catalyst that will help, especially on renewables, movement forward. There are many, many areas that I see that there is progress and we need to build on that while addressing some of the deficiencies we have. Lastly, the issue of adversarial approach, and this is where we as a presidency have detected over the years. Egypt. We have an old tradition of diplomacy and, and, and centrist kind of approaches to these issues and attempts to find reconciliation and, and, and compromise. And we've exercised that in the past, including through cooperations with our German counterparts on various occasions where I think we help breakthroughs happen by finding the middle ground and bringing people closer to that. This challenge, and many of us have been working in multilateral diplomacy, we always say it's a global issue, it's a global issue. I've never seen anything as global where it doesn't matter what one country does, but everybody has to make their reasonable contributions to the effort. So we need to rise to the challenge. We need to rise above the petty differences. National interests are important, and every delegation will go to a COP or to any conference for that matter from a national perspective, I want to gain everything. My boss is going to hold me accountable if I don't get 99%. So I want, but this, this is a different forum. It doesn't work that way. So we hope, Petersburg Dialogue, and I don't wanna, I mean, uh, my dear friend Jennifer is going to address that and, and maybe report on it a little bit as uh, I'll just hint at it. It was very useful for us as, as an incoming presidency. It gave us better clarity on the variety of issues um, we would hope to see the goodwill expressed by ministers trickle down to the negotiating rooms, which is essential. It doesn't happen, hasn't happened in the past. We will still hope that ministers will have a better understanding of the opposite perspective, and they will talk to their technical negotiators and push them and urge them, you know what, we can be flexible here. We can be more understanding there. That way, maybe we will have a chance. Time is of the essence. The urgency is there. Everyone is on board and understands the gravity of the situation. We didn't need, or Germany didn't need to see this heat wave to realize you've been aware of this and you've known it, but it's just a physical manifestation that people see for themselves and understand how dire it is. 
And if you think this is bad, you need to see the effects and the impacts on agriculture, on management of water resources and other things in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, including in Egypt, the impact of the rise of sea level on the Egyptian Delta, which is our food source and export source and everything where 50% of the Egyptian population lives, their livelihoods. Lands are being, you can't use them anymore and, and people will, will have to find different livelihoods. It's, it's a slow impact kind of change, but it is happening because of the rise of, so people are seeing it. They are real issues. It's not this vague, you know, concept. So I'll wrap it up there. I tried to put in as many ideas I could. I tried to put in as many ideas I could in a few minutes and talk real fast, but uh, I'm sure in the, in the conversation, the chat will, will get into other issues that are of more interest to you. So thank you very much for having us. Pleasure. Thank you very much for that, Ambassador. I have a green light. I hope you can hear me. Is this mic better? Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for that. He is, of course, the special representative uh, for COP27, the president designate. Uh, at this juncture, I'd like to invite Jennifer Morgan uh, to give her opening remarks. She is the state secretary and special envoy for inter an international climate action for the Gem German Federal Foreign Office. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, colleagues and friends, um, dear YL and the Egyptian delegation here. Um, thank you for the chance to um, share some thoughts and have a dialogue um, here tonight. And I think uh, YL did an incredibly good job of, of talking about you know, the, the crisis, the moment that we're now in um, as we meet together. And it's obviously um, a critical time. And it's a critical time not only for um, obviously the climate crisis, but for all the multiple crises that are coming together at the same time. So the, the food crisis obviously, which is hitting um, Egypt and other countries um, due to climate, but also due to the Russian aggression and the blockades. Uh, the pandemic uh, and all of the economic um, uh, consequences from that, the debt uh, crisis that is there. And all of this is on top of existing inequities that um, are just getting worse. Uh, and so, you know, if you, if you put that in the mix and you think, my gosh, um, where we are today and the impacts we're seeing around the world in comparison to what the scientists, um, what we thought when we signed Paris, even, just seven years ago. I mean, I just think about, well, even before then, when I would read climate models, and I would, I would say, okay, yeah, these adverse effects, so when it gets hotter, then, yeah, the air conditioning, and then that's a, a, a sub-effect of having to have more uh, emissions from those impacts, or the types of events that scientists predicted um, that I just thought were just unimaginable, and, and they're happening and we all know it. So I think all of these things, uh, we have to think these crises through together um, and really realize that they're coming at a time of this tremendous um, inequalities. We are also living at in a moment of disruption. And if I learned anything in Greenpeace, to harken back to my last job, it's that um, in moments um, of disruption, there are openings. I think we're in a moment where um, the linkages between peace and energy security and the climate crisis, they've never been clearer. And perhaps what we've spent decades and years trying to explain um, and it to the public, um, in a way it's now real. And we're really at a crossroads, I think, um, uh, of, of the energy transition. And we have to be incredibly vigilant um, because, you know, on the one hand, I think that there are countries, and I would count Germany in there, and the European Union, maybe not enough yet, but I think uh, we are working hard to accelerate our energy transformation, to scale up renewables. Many of you in the room know about that. Um, but I think that there are others that are working to use this moment actually to build long-term 
fossil fuel infrastructure that will lock out a 1.5 degree future. So we have to be clear that we don't slip into these rollbacks um, and do that um, by accelerating our transition to sustainable agriculture, a slower circular economy, obviously 100% renewables and efficiency, and we have to stand in solidarity with the most vulnerable in the world. And as uh, Christiana opened with, I think Minister Baerbach uh, uh, has really um, feels that very deeply. I know I do um, as well. So what does this mean for COP27? Well, we've heard about the different issues. I think um, from our perspective, we have to make progress on all issues. Um, and we have to build the trust and the confidence, I think, that we're striding ahead together. Um, and that the support promised is going to be um, delivered and uh, moving forward. So adaptation, obviously, top priority, African COP. I think there we have to get uh, much clearer on how we actually measure progress and set priorities um, to achieve this global goal on adaptation. Maybe there are areas where it's so clear that there are interdependencies on the global level, whether it be food security, whether it be also water cross boundary, that, that we could focus on. I think in the past days in the Petersburg Dialogue, we heard a lot about the fact that you know, there's a global framework that we're building, but actually we know how important empowering local efforts are local communities, adaptation is local, so we need to have those co-developed adaptation strategies that owned and driven by local communities. Um, so that's, you know, and moving forward on adaptation, I'm gonna be kind of very high level here, so, so we'll just set, set the scene here. Uh, uh, loss and damage um, obviously is a vital issue. Uh, and I agree that it's been, and we agree that it's been an issue that has not gotten the attention um, that is that has uh, that it deserves and has been needed, and I think is even more so uh, the case as the impacts are hitting so hard. Um, and I think it's um, it's a, not just a topic also uh, for developing countries. It is a massive topic there because, as as Weil said, the ability to then deal with those impacts is is much more difficult. But it was a, in the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, it was a topic for every country. And you heard delegates and ministers speak about what was happening in their country right now and how they're trying to deal with it um, in, a, in a socially um, uh, aware way, how they're dealing with the devastating impacts um, and noting uh, how the poorest and most vulnerable are hit the hardest. So we stand ready to engage fully uh, on the range of topics on loss and damage. Uh, we want to go deeper on understanding actually what this means. <laughs> how do we um, define that? Um, how we understand the needs of countries and how we address those needs systematically with a range of different approaches, whether it be technical, capacity building, technologies, data, but also finance. And looking at, okay, how do we um, address this inside and outside uh, the UNFCCC? But I think uh, what we also heard over the past couple of days and what we all know is that we have to continue to dramatically, or continue, we have to dramatically cut greenhouse gas emissions now. And that has to be really a priority because it's, it's the only chance that we have to limit the climate impacts moving forward and, uh, and also to limit the adaptation piece, and we know that there are limits to adaptation. We all know that. So we know we're not on track. We know we're heading to 2.4 to 2.7 degrees, according to the Climate Action Tracker. Um, and I think, so there's a few things there priority for COP27. Number one is countries, especially those that have not done so, they have to enhance their NDCs. Uh, there are a number of countries that have yet to do that, and they're important, uh, and that needs to move forward. It, it needs to be in line with that 1.5 degree uh, pathway. The G7 um, in June at the heads level also agreed to strengthen the targets within the NDCs uh, and gave some ideas of what that could look like. It could be sectoral targets in addition to the enhancement of the NDC, but some countries might want to come forward and put a sectoral target on the table. Some may want to add an additional greenhouse gas. Uh, some may want to go for renewable energy targets, but we need the momentum. This is also where we really need the campaigning of NGOs, if I may uh, say, in each country to say, okay, where's the coal phase out? Okay, where's the, the increase of renewables law? Okay, where is, where's the, the agriculture uh, component that's sustainable? 
Um, and then I think we also um, really need to uh, accelerate the implementation on sectoral issues um, and integrate those. And that's why we really want to see a, a robust uh, multi-year uh, mitigation work program at COP27. So that's kind of the mitigation piece. And then, of course, underpinning all of this is the access and availability of finance. So, um, you know, as Wael said, um, Stephen Gilbo and I have accepted the request of the UK COP president uh, to do this uh, progress report on the delivery plan. Um, and, you know, those 10 points, please go through those 10 points. We need your input. We're doing consultation right now with countries, with NGOs, with experts. But how do we include, increase um, the access, improve the access to finance? How can it be that for some countries it takes four years to move, move through the system? How can it be that all of this is so complex that particularly the least developed countries, the SIDS, cannot access finance? What's the role? How do we get uh, international financial institutions to really step up to the plate? The, the World Bank, uh, the other regional development banks. Um, how do we actually get accountability in the role of the private sector? Lots of commitments. Where are they? Are they going to be delivered? Uh, com commensurate with what developing countries are, are looking for. Um, and, but we also know that the 100 billion isn't going to cut it alone. We all know this. Um, a very important uh, number. But I think the other piece that we really want to see in Glasgow is the beginning of a serious conversation of, of the third long-term Paris goal. Do, you, do we all know what this is, 2-1-C? Uh, for, the, for the Paris Agreement geeks, um, that is um, actually shifting the trillions, actually getting all financial flows to be in line with the 1.5 goal. So that is also uh, needs a dedicated um, space. So I think just wrapping up um, on the Petersburg Climate Dialogue, I think um, what we tried to do, we talked about all these issues. We tried to arrange the agenda so that loss and damage and adaptation and finance um, got uh, a good amount of time. We went uh, mitigation as well, but we went into world cafes, tried some new ways of working. Um, some, one minister said that her partner said, um, are you crazy, ministers doing world cafes uh, in smaller groups? But I think it was useful because people could go more into detail uh, and into real dialogue. Um, I hope that we were able to um, start to build a little bit of trust that uh, people are being heard, but obviously it's in the action at the end of the day that will really matter. Um, and I think the other thing to know is, even in the midst of the current context that I described, no one questioned 1.5 degrees. No one questioned that we need to move forward in the transformation that we're going. It's a question of the how and getting the, the, the pace and scale of change. So I guess the other thing I just want to say is that I know, um, we know, that without movements, without an engaged civil society on the international level and nationally, I know we will not get there. We will not get there. So um, we need your ideas. We need your pressure. We need your challenges um, in order to uh, move forward quickly with real action uh, that we know we desperately need. And like I said, we're in a disruptive moment, so um, let's step into that moment together and uh, drive transformation and climate justice. Thanks so much. Thanks very much, uh, Jennifer, for that. Uh, at this juncture, we're going to have a bit of a, a panel now, and I'd like to invite uh, my panelists to join me uh, up front here. Uh, we have Ambassador Mohammed Nasser. He is the lead negotiator and head of climate, environment, and sustainable development department uh, at the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, you can take your seat, sir. We will have Mr. Christoph Falls. <laughs> Policy Director for German Watch, uh, member uh, of the Speak Off Board of the Climate Alliance Germany. You take your seat. <laughs> and Dr. Camilla Bausch, uh, Scientific and Executive Director of the Ecologic Institute. You can join me up front here as well. <laughs> I think we'll stay put here for now, just as we are. Uh, and I'll invite the others to, to join us a little bit later because we will have some videos that we'll go back to our seats to watch uh, in a short while uh, from now. Uh, but Ambassador, if you wouldn't mind me starting uh, with you, you're on the negotiating side of things. Um, 
could you just give us a sense of what is the state of play in the run-up to COP27, uh, in the run-up to those negotiations? Do we have momentum um, also against the backdrop of uh, Petersburg and, and the G7 summit? Do you think that we'll have a successful summit by the end of it? Okay, thank you so much and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, another climate talks and let me say that I did attend the first Cairo climate talks 10 years ago and it was the first one. I also attended the anniversary, the 10 years anniversary, uh, I think uh, early this year uh, coming back from, from Glasgow. So you have another uh, talks happening in Cairo <coughs> and our embassy in Addis Ababa has established uh, Addis Ababa climate talks starting I think beginning of this year. So it is finding its way everywhere, the climate talks. Uh, it's, it's a very good initiative that is being uh, happening in other places. So where we are and uh, what, uh, what is our expectations? Of course, as an incoming presidency, I have to say that it has to be a successful COP. Uh, this is the first point. Uh, the second point, <laughs> it is important to say, like also to highlight that the success is not a success for presidency, success for the parties and the international community. And any backsliding is not a backsliding by the presidency, but rather a backsliding by the international community. So the framing of COP27 comes within, do we have the enabling environment internationally that allows us all to move forward building on what we agreed in the delicate balance in, in Paris, and what we confirmed in Glasgow to move forward in Sharm el-Sheikh? I think, yes, we do have that. And um, following what Ambassador Royal has mentioned and Jennifer has mentioned, we, we can see it from a presidency side now, not from a negotiating side, that the political will and the political commitment is there from all levels. But sometimes, and we saw this in Glasgow and we saw it in the SPs in Bonn, sometimes this political will is not yet going down to the negotiator side, sometimes. And, and, and this year it is more challenging because of, um, as was mentioned by Ambassador Royal and Jennifer, we have several other uh, challenges that have popped up. If you, if you have asked me this question in January, I would have said, well, yes, most probably, yes, we'll have this. We know we, are, we already identified what would be the deliverables, the outcomes. Now, and we are in July, we have a food crisis, energy crisis, debt crisis, finance crisis, geopolitical crisis. Uh, and on top of them, we have science that is telling us we are not on track, both on adaptation and mitigation. Uh, but on the other hand, and, and we are seeing um, some declarations by major developed countries saying that while we are in emergency situation, so we have, we have to take emergency measures that, were, that are not in line with what we have provided before. But this is one side of it. The other side, which we are also hearing as presidency and, and different stakeholders, and we, what was just confirmed in Petersburg, Petersburg Dialogue, that, and as Jennifer mentioned, this is a time uh, that is critical, but it also opens opportunities. So we're seeing that the transition and transformation that we all agreed to in Paris, and we confirmed in Glasgow, instead of taking longer time when it comes to energy specifically, it is taking a shorter time. We are seeing commitments to enhance uh, any, uh, like renewable energy in many developed countries with percentages that were not envisaged before the current crisis is. So we believe that this environment will allow us when we reach uh, Sharm el-Sheikh to deliver. But what are we delivering on? And this is the question. And what elements are there to deliver on? And, and as Ambassador Royal have, have identified, we think that the package that will be coming out of, of Sharm el-Sheikh first has to be implementation focused because there is no time to have another round or a third or a, I don't know, I mean, I've been in this process for too long, uh, tenth round of planning and uh, pledging and so on. It has to be happening on the ground. It has to be at scale and on time. Um, so this is the first one. The second one is that we cannot overlook what the, what is being put forward as part of the clear demands from several groups of countries, specifically developing countries, when it comes to adaptation, when it comes to finance, and when it comes to loss and damage. It has to be taken forward and has to be taken forward meaningfully with a clear outcome that is a deliverable rather than an outcome that is procedural. Let's have a discussion for another two or three years. And the third one is that we have all agreed and we have seen it here and in Europe that it has to be just the transition that we all agreed to in, in, in Paris and confirmed in Glasgow has to happen through a just process, just in the meaning that it has to be managed. So we know we are phasing out and phasing in and phasing down and phasing in. How are we doing that? So we don't fall in a trap 
where many countries, specifically in Africa and many developing countries, people are paying higher prices for things that, I mean, they were not part of it. I mean, like if you if you look at the energy prices now, I mean, if if Europe has the resilience to be able to deal with the energy prices, I don't think in Africa they are it is uh, they are able to do that, or in many developing countries. So that transition which we agreed to, with the time frame that we agreed to, has to be managed clearly. That allows for this. Um, like uh, containing the potential uh, impacts. And two, it has to take into consideration the social and economic dimensions. I mean, and, and there is always this um, uh, example that we put forward, um, transport, I'm not talking about energy. Transport is a very important element. It is the second highest or third highest when it comes to emissions. When you talk about sustainable transport through a metro or a light uh, tram or, uh, or a BRT uh, in developing countries, this means that you have a number of micro enterprises going out and those micro enterprises you need to do the transition for them through a decent work agenda so they find another job opportunity so social economic has to be taken into consideration for us when we define the outcome ambassador well has mentioned it jennifer has mentioned it this is a, a progress across the board on all the elements in the negotiations but not only that clear progress when it comes to the expanded cop that we see which is the uh, the, uh, the other stakeholders, be it financial institutions. We believe that the financial institutions should also transform, well, they are not transforming. When you come back to me and say, you need to have bankable projects, so you are not, sorry, you are not transforming because your definition of bankability as a financial institution is profit or private sector is profit. It has to be the social impact. It has to be the environmental impact. So we need to see this. We need to look at the cost of finance now with the higher interest rates um, internationally. And this, we need to look at that. So we need to look at innovative ways to bring this down or bring the right finance, the appropriate finance to come um, to, the, to the developing countries to unlock the potentials. I mean, it's nice to talk about billions to trillions and there is 130 trillion waiting out there to, to move forward. But reality is 80% of Africa is not investment grade. So it will never touch Africa. Uh, many developing countries have high risk, so the cost of the of finance in Africa is high. So from our definition, from our point of view and outcome, in the negotiations focused, we have uh, loss and damage, we have to deliver on that. Uh, we have the global goal on adaptation and the new goal on finance, collective goal on finance. They have to, to deliver substantive outcomes, not just another process that, yes, we took note of the progress, so it has to showcase that for the different uh, stakeholders and for the different parties that yes we are serious about delivering on that work program on mitigation is crucial this is a critical decade we need to have a process that delivers on mitigation raising ambition and on finance and by the way finance was not even discussed in the sbs and bond i think this is, has always been a cornerstone if we are able to move forward not only the 100 billion and the 100 billion is if you compare it to the standing committee uh, report on needs, which is 5.4 trillion. This is this is nothing, but it is a, a showcasing that we are delivering on our promises. So on finance, we need that. On finance, we need to look at the innovative sources. On finance, we need to look on how can we fund do this long list of pipeline of projects. By the way, I mean you have a long list of pipeline of projects in the GCF and the GEF and uh, adaptation fund and all of them. So projects are there. You have an NDC projects that are there. So let's find the ways to fund them instead of running around of this is high risk, this is, I mean, we're adding conditionalities. If we unlock all of that, we'll have a successful cup from a human being point of view and a normal person point of view. Negotiator point of view and presidency point of view, I'm sure that we'll have a, a, a successful cup because if we have a failure, this is a failure to the system. It will take us back so many years. Um, wrong messaging, private sector, wrong message to, to the people. People will not accept that. Thanks so much for that. And I guess I'd, I'd, I'd like to come over to you uh, now, Christoph, because what is German civil society's uh, sort of perspective on this? What would make COP27 a successful summit from, from where you sit? Yes, it's, um, first of all, thank you for um, bringing this talk together here. And, um, and it's the right time for doing this. Um, and. Um, and, uh, thank you also for Jennifer and Mohamed um, for your uh, presentations. Um, I think many of the things I we need is a combination of the two things you have said here from the um, from the outcome. But um, uh, I want to be a bit more concrete. Um, I, um, uh, what we um, it's embedded in a couple of crises what we see at the moment at the COP. 
Um, and from my perspective, we need a clear signal of solidarity before the COP from um, the, let's say, the G7 countries. Um, in the, uh, and um, how would it be if 30% um, of the grain going to the food, to the animal sector and to the um, biofuel sector um, would be given to the world market to feed the people who are hungry at the moment and can't afford the high um, prices there. Um, <clears throat> such a signal uh, would um, open many um, negotiator hurts there, really, to, to think, uh, well, okay, they get serious. They didn't show the same solidarity in the corona crisis, but now they get start to get serious about it. Um, I think th this kind of signal would be very helpful. Um, there might be similar signals um, in the field of um, to be serious about the new debt crisis. Um, but in the field of the new debt crisis, we must also be serious that this is now not any longer mainly an issue of the G7, but mainly an issue of China. So we also must um, get China on board in uh, to discussing this. Um, it cannot be in this only then finger pointing on the G7, but it must be a joint activity there. And then coming to the uh, issues really negotiated at the COP, um, that's, uh, um, of course, um, uh, mitigation is absolutely key, and I would put mitigation as part of a loss and damage package, because if we want to prevent a, a loss and damage in a scale which is not longer manageable, we have to be serious about the 1.5 decree. Um, and, um, so, um, the, um, and there, I'm at the moment most concerned about the um, G7 and investing in LNG and coal in other countries. And not yet, we have all the nice words, and now from Chancellor Scholz and Kerry in the Petersburg, uh, Petersburger Dialogue, um, uh, that this one will not lead to a lock-in, but we need a, a clear process to show that this is the case. We need clear criteria to show that this is the case. Um, and I think we need this to present in the ethicop to show, look, this is a very short term, and then we will increase the speed of moving to renewable energies, energy efficiency, green hydrogen, heat pumps, and so on, um, in such a, a speed that, it, th that we are better in 2030 than we have promised until now. That would be, uh, if we can show this, I think then this is uh, oh, uh, acceptable. But um, otherwise, it will destroy the trust, um, the trust after the Glasgow um, uh, pact was done that now a couple of countries say, no, we can't do what we have promised there. Um, uh, then um, uh, we need the good, a good mitigation work program in addition to the NDC enhancement. So I do not want to double what you have said about this. Um, but um, we really have to think about sectors where we need an enhancement. That is, from my perspective, the key of the mitigation work program to move to for clear sector outcomes and to get the countries together who are crucial for a positive momentum in this regard. Then um, let's me come to uh, adaptation. I think <clears throat> it was a breakthrough to get now an agreement to speak two years about a global goal. Um, and we, it took us more than 10 years to move to this point. So that's why it was a breakthrough, but only in di diplomatical terms. It, was not, but it wasn't a breakthrough for the people affected from climate change. So we have to come very cl clear on criteria, um, how to measure success in the adaptation field, um, but we, all, we then have to deliver in implementing it. Um, so that's in, in the field of adaptation, I think it's absolutely necessary, but the big show in the field of adaptation will, will be on loss and damage. This is the next step, and, um, and thank you for the 
Egypt presidency and that you've put um, uh, the um, f financial um, uh, support for a loss and damage as one of the negotiating, negotiating points. Looking at the Petersburg um, dialogue, I think industrialized countries, at least uh, quite a number of them, are moving in a direction to support this negotiating point. Although this is a big breakthrough and it would be a big breakthrough in diplomatic terms, but it doesn't deliver one euro to the people. So that's the next step. So what I would love to see is a group of um, industrialized countries saying we are jump-starting this. It's not just speaking about it, but we look for a group of developing countries, really vulnerable and affected um, developing countries, and there we start the first um, payments for them immediately and promise this at the COP. I think this kind of signal um, would be extremely helpful. We got a, a small signal like this from Scotland last time um, that was a starting point, moving to keep it, giving a little bit of money in this direction, but um, to scale this up and to move in this direction, um, that would be for a loss and damage, my um, hope. And my last, po no, second last point is finance. Um, I think we, uh, um, the 100 billion, I hope that we get this la next year, and as Mr. John Kerry said, hopefully this year. So we should keep up the pressure that it's possible this year. Um, but then we have to move to the far bigger debate, what can we deliver in, um, starting from 25? Um, and we know that is in a totally different scale, where we have to shift the trillions, as Geneva has said. Um, and, um, and I saw quite interesting the debate in the Petersburg Climate Dialogue about um, new Bretton Woods. So how to change the, and you have, Ask the same just now, how to change the way how the multilateral development banks, how the World Bank, how the IMF is working, and um, how the special drawing rights can play a totally different role than so far for financing in this context. So really to move in the next couple of years in this direction. Um, I think that's uh, to get a real start about this um, now in, in Egypt. Um, and then I want to come to the last point, the role of civil society. And, um, I, um, so I've worked in the civil society for climate change for the last 30 years. And um, I got a lot of us to join a company or the parliament, uh, to support parliamentarians or to move to the government and so on. I always said it's far more influential what we can do as a, um, a civil society. And so I'm absolutely convinced a civil society, if you look for adaptation, without civil society, this will not work in no country. Um, if you think about decentralized renewable energy or energy efficiency, this needs civil society, otherwise it will not work. And, um, and now I've heard your welcoming words for civil society um, uh, just a few minutes ago. But I also see the concerns at the moment from civil society actors, especially from poorer, poorer countries, about the affordability um, uh, for staying at the COP and for um, uh, that the prices for the rooms are quite high. And I know there are discussions on the way to trying to solve this, but I would like to understand better where this stands. Um, and, um, and we also got letters from civil society from Egypt saying, look, we are asked either not to participate or not independently to participate. I'm not sure, I, I didn't check this and so. I just saw so it's an issue of concern and I want to address it because I think um, we, we need a clear access for a civil society and that they don't have any fear and so that we, they really can be there. Um, and I hope that this is also true for the colleagues from Egypt, that they can participate in that way. So thank you very much. It's quite a lot I'm asking for, but I think that's my measure uh, uh, and uh, criteria for a successful COP. Thanks so much for that. Um, Ambassador Nasser, I know that you wanted to, to respond to that. 
Um, perhaps I'll allow you to, to, to do that now and then we can settle that before yeah, we move Thank on. you so much. And very quickly on this because there is a lot of misinformation and uh, some of it is our responsibility because the information is not very clear on the website. Uh, but uh, anyways, on the civil society specifically, one on the accommodation. Uh, the government has, I mean, the, the whole hotel business is a private sector hotel business, so it, we cannot control it yet. The government has intervened and, and put uh, um, uh, maximum prices for the two and three uh, hotel rooms, uh, the hotels, two and three stars, and those around like 8,000 auditoriums. And the maximum price there was 240 to 260 for a double room. And it starts from $90 for a single and 120 for a for a double, so that means that $60 per, for a double room. I stayed in African, um, like in meetings in African countries, and I paid $200, and others from the NGOs were also participating. So we are doing our best to make sure that on the hotel side, affordability is there. <coughs> so it is there. This is one. Two, there are other modes, of course. You have Airbnb and others, and Sharm has everything. What we are also working on and ensuring is that transport from different parts of Sharm el-Sheikh. So if you're staying in the city itself, which is like 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers away, you will have transport. So on this one, we are securing that. Um, on the NGO participation, this process is a UN process. It is not an Egypt COP. So the process for accreditation is the one that applies for all NGOs. Unfortunately, in the Middle East, there is only one NGO that is accredited. So many NGOs in, in, in the Middle East were, did not apply or applied late, so they didn't, don't have this accreditation. Yet, we have worked as the presidency team to ensure that we have more African NGOs who are not accredited, and Egyptian NGOs who are not accredited. And now, at, um, we, are, we have almost 50, 60, 60 who are not accredited that will get single-time accreditation between African and Egyptian, only for this cup. So the information that is being sent around might not be accurate. So this is one. Another thing is that we are having all the space and everything that allows for the civil society to express its views, because civil society is an integral part of this process. Uh, and that's why Jennifer has mentioned that those are the ones who really move the process. I've been in this process not as long as you, of course, but, but uh, I've seen how civil society can move things, and we are strong believers in that. So on this side, I think we want to rectify the misinformation that is there. One, on the participation, it is linked only to the UN. It's not in our hands yet. We did the maximum effort so we can bring in as many NGO and civil society organizations from Africa and Egypt that we can bring in that allows, uh, by the way, that fits the criteria that is there by the UFCCC. Two, for the participation, the, what, to, what governs the participation of, of any civil society is the code of conduct and the rules that the UFCCC has, be it in the conference center or out of the conference center. So this is something also that we need to highlight, that everybody and all of you or whoever have been attending this process, they know that for delegates, for civil, everybody uh, follows the, the rule of, con the, the, the code of conduct and, and the rules. And three, um, on affordability, um, the website is, I know it is challenging. We are working with, we're fixing it hopefully next week, but please check, book, and, and, and the prices are starting from $60 per person if it is in a double room. It goes all the way, of course, like the five stars, I cannot control it. Uh, you know this, how this process works, you know who attends, and sometimes an organization will go and take a whole hotel from, I mean, the whole hotel. Uh, I cannot tell the hotel you cannot take this, this, this client. I mean, it's, it is a private sector thing. But what I can do is I can secure enough rooms as much as I can for all those who, who will not be able to afford this, uh, this expensive hotel, so, and we are doing that. Hope this clarifies that. Okay, thanks so much for that. And if there are follow-ups, we will have some audience Q&A to, to perhaps look into that further. Uh, but to get away from, from the logistics uh, for, for a short while, uh, Dr. Dr. Bausch, uh, we've heard from the Egyptian delegation that this has to be about implementation. Um, but in the run-up to this, can you talk of the momentum that you've seen uh, so that we have implementation at COP27? Also, can you talk a little bit about the G7? For example, Germany has had the presidency of the G7. We've had lots about the climate change agenda. Uh, can you talk to us about the momentum that you've seen there? And there will be G20 as well. Thank you very much, um, Your Excellencies, friends, colleagues. It's wonderful to be here and to discuss what can and should be delivered end of the year. But before I enter into that, I want to say I was at several climate talks in Cairo, and it was always a wonderful pleasure to contribute there. 
and um, I heard with excitement that it should be about implementation. I think that's exactly the right word which we have to hear in the room. And I very much liked what Jennifer said when she said she's working towards a work stream or she thinks it would be important for the COP to decide on a work stream on 21C, so on shifting the trillion. I think that would be exciting and links to a lot of the topics we have heard about. And listening to Christoph, I think everybody in the room now knows about the value of civil society getting engaged. So um, I uh, very much appreciated these interventions. I think it proved the point. Um, and it also, by the way, links to the fourth pillar we heard when we were negotiating on the Paris Agreement. We heard about the fourth pillar was the non-state actors which are needed to make Paris happen, so the Paris Agreement wouldn't have happened without the non-state actors, but also to implement Paris. So there is the link, because how Paris is set up, it's set up in a way that you basically need that for monitoring, for implementation, for driving ambition, for all of what we've talked about. So, but now, after my references, I, I come back to your question and uh, quickly look at the dynamics coming from G7, maybe from G20, and let me first look at what can they deliver. Obviously, they are not part of the UNFCCC. It's an independent group of specific countries, so let's keep that in mind. However, when you look at it, they have in the past and they can create kind of a dynamic or also stagnation. And we have seen that in the past, in 2007, it was the then G8, very different times, which made sure the US doesn't go off board of the UNFCCC process. It was the, under then President Bush who kind of came in here and committed to the process. In 2017, Angela Merkel, on the contrary, said that the talks on climate were very disappointing in the G7. Now, let's look at the more immediate past. In the last year, in the run-up to the Glasgow COP, it was quite an unusual setup. We had the Brits and the, the Italians heading respectively the G7 and the G20, and then presiding together with the lead kind of, of the Brits, but together over the COP. And in this context, obviously, you were, they were able to create a dynamic which worked towards climate neutrality commitments. They worked towards language on coal financing phase out. They worked towards um, language which then supported the phase out of fossil f international fossil fuel financing, um, which we then saw in certain declarations and work also in Glasgow. This year is obviously much more difficult for many reasons. First, it was not this alignment of presidencies. This time it's the German presidency for G7, G20 is with Indonesia and we have the Egyptian presidency of the COP, but I must say they talk and work together. So they are not, not unaware of each other, but it's not such an alignment as we saw last year. Second, for the G7 presidency, the government was just establishing itself and it was kind of a challenge to have the internal structural reforms while already hit the road running with bicycle, of course. But anyway, um, so, so that was a challenge. If one thinks of financing, I think it was weak. However, there were some entry points where I think there might be a follow-up in the months to come. Maybe it's kind of to be expected, but not there yet. Um, then one big thing which was a success for Chancellor Scholz was the Climate Club. So we, there is a commitment to see the initiation of a climate club by the, an open and inclusive climate club by the end of this year. However, I think conceptually, 
this club is still not very strong yet. So there needs to be a lot of work put into to make that something strong in the context of international action. And I think it might become a strong point if it's not only, which it already is, linked to 1.5 degree and to, to the Paris Agreement, but if it links to industrial decarbonization. If you think where it started from, let's make that, we talked about the sectoral targets and like, let's make that a cornerstone for industrial decarbonization where it really can deliver. I think then it can be thinking of standards, about ambition, about lead markets, that can be something interesting starting from that group. Secondly, it was linked in a somewhat unclear language, it was linked to the Just Energy Transition Partnership debt piece. And I think that's also an interesting thing. We all heard about the South African approach last year where $8.5 billion were committed to the transformation of the energy sector in South Africa. And it was a selective approach, but kind of linked to the global challenge. I think that is very interesting. And it will still have to deliver on the ground and has to show the governance which will work towards that. That is also a challenge to the South African government. They have to deliver. Um, but that's an interesting approach and that has been strengthened in El Mao. There is a Jack P under consideration for India, the incoming G20 presidency for Indonesia, the current G20 presidency for Vietnam and for Senegal, most prominently discussed in the realm of the German press right now because of Chancellor Scholz wanting to invest in new gas infrastructure in Senegal, which is kind of a very controversial issue in the context and has also relevance for, for the COP. So I think there is quite a bit of potential if the group with partners is able to, to construct and deliver in these fields. And it is also, and I, then I have to come to an end, I just want to mention there is a commitment for decarbonizing um, the, the power sector, the transport sector, and to work on the phase out of um, fossil fuel subsidies, but they are always kind of softening language elements, so it's highly decarbonizing, predominantly decarbonizing, phasing out inefficient subsidies. So let's have a look, and there again, we need civil society to work towards delivering. And on G20, ask, then I can allude to that, but my time is running out. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I'd like to invite back onto to the front chair, Jennifer Morgan and um, Ambassador Abu Macht, because I'd like for you to, to react to some of what we've heard. Uh, I've chosen your seat, and that, that, that's your seat over there. Um, and Jennifer, if you can take that seat over there. Perhaps you can get started, Ambassador. I mean, what do you make of what you've, what you've heard from, from, from the panelists? Just very quick remarks, please. Yeah, I, I think I need an hour, but I'll try to <laughs> summarize, because uh, they're disparate points, but very, very important points. I'll start with the one that I forgot, and I promised I'd get to, based on your title here, climate justice. We tend, in the heat of the negotiations, to ignore intentionally or forget that the principle enshrined, not only in the UNFCCC, but in the very Article 2 itself, Two has two, one ABC, and then two has two, two. Equity and common but differentiated responsibilities. This is the cornerstone. This is the understanding upon which developing countries who had no responsibility in the mess that we are in came on board to be good global citizens based on an understanding that equity is an integral part of the legal regime that we're creating and that yes, we all have a common responsibility, but it is differentiated. The problem with this uh, ignoring of this, these two notions is that over time it will erode confidence by developing countries in the process and in its equity. And I have said this back in 2018 when we were presiding over the G77, 
and China, and everyone in the room was celebrating in Katowice, I didn't want to be the guy who ruined the party, but in the midst of the corking of the champagne, I had to say, I worry for this regime. We are creating an imbalanced regime that is highly mitigation-centric for a good reason, but I worry that countries may feel left behind. And the moment a developing country feels left behind is the moment that head of state or prime minister will fail to prioritize and will not have no choice but to not prioritize climate action over sewage and water and, and dealing with catastrophes. So this is one point about climate justice. It is essential. It is not a luxury. It is the, the guarantee that this regime will stay intact because once people start feeling left behind, the regime crumbles. And ba from a public international law perspective, this is not the most solid legal regime. It depends on the goodwill and the buy-in of everyone. So I think it's in the interest of everyone to feel taken care of. But once groups of countries or interests start feeling left behind, the regime itself fades and doesn't succeed in, in delivering. Which takes me to a related point, which is defining and describing and ascribing success. I wasn't around when the League of Nations was created. It was part of my thesis and I studied it, but I know that they must have been celebrating the League of Nations and people celebrated Kyoto and people celebrated Paris. What I'm trying to say is that the verdict is still out. None of this has been implemented. All of it is wonderful words on pages, including the Glasgow Pact and the Glasgow Outcomes. They will become worthy of celebration the moment we see that we are successfully on the right path, on the right trajectory to fully implementing the Paris Agreement. We're not there yet, so let's hold the champagne for a little bit until we see. That's what I mean by the verdict is still out on all of these things, including the most recent things. We have a commitment from 2009, was it in Copenhagen, for the 100 billion. And we, I mean, I don't want to point fingers, that's not the intention, but it hasn't been delivered. And as I said, it, it, is, it is a drop in the ocean of the needs. Same applies to many other things, including the doubling of the adaptation that came out. It's wonderful, and we appreciate the goodwill and the political will, but we'll believe it when we see it. So that's the second point on the verdict is out on many things, so let's hold it a little bit and see where we go on the actual implementation of any of the pledges. And that takes me to a related point. Glasgow, in parallel to the negotiating process, you had extensive pledges from governments, and you also had private sector entities and others. Good and well, but these have no mechanism for follow-up. So I'll be very happy to see how they follow up, and maybe I'll find an article or a researcher who follows up and says grades A plus or B or C or D or fail. So that would be good to know, because we heard good things and people had the photo op, as we said, then they have a responsibility to deliver on the pledges. And this applies to governments, but also to institutions, corporations that committed to net zero and other things. Um, finance. I, I, I hate to, to be negative, but finance is, as I said, and many would agree, I think, is the cross-cutting issue, the catalyst that's going to help us do all of the actual work on the ground. And I've been in this process for a while, and I've been hearing the expression billions to trillions all the time. But the facts on the ground tell me that, and again, it's another proof of how mitigation-centric this regime is. Show me a viable business model in adaptation. If you had a million dollars in your pocket now that you'd say, wow, there's a great return on my million dollars in adaptation. It doesn't exist. The figures, the actual figures from the EU, as last time I checked, were anywhere less than 5% of private money. 95% of private investments from the EU, roughly, that was 2019 figures. It might, I heard it's getting better, but a very meager amount. But the overwhelming majority, for logical reasons, will go to mitigation projects. You can invest in solar. You can invest in whatever aspect that reduces greenhouse gases. From the United States, the figure was about 1%. And of that 1% and of that 5%, the overwhelming majority, logically, understandably, is invested in the EU. And so it is not going to solve the terrible finance adaptation problem in the developing world. So I, I need to always qualify. When we say billions to trillions, be fair, be honest, say this is billions to trillions of money going for profit in mitigation. 
don't give a misguided impression that billions to trillions are going to solve loss and damage or are going to solve adaptation. So this is just a qualifier and, 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 and I think it, it is worth mentioning. The elephant in the room is that climate action entails and relates to industries and businesses and profit and trade. So it is a pervasive sentiment in the negotiations that trade advantages are going to always be influencing and directing um, national positions where they have a profit to make or where they stand to lose. I'm not going to get into details or name names, but this is something that we as negotiations will always sense. We'll know that if there is a national interest, it's going to supersede and be prioritized over the noble claim of doing my part in the climate action. That's what more clearly saying what I tried to say diplomatically earlier, that we need to rise to the occasion and move a little bit away from the narrow national interest perspective into this global one because literally we are sharing a planet and climate change knows no borders and the influence and the impacts are going to influence and impact everyone. So those are just disparate points, not responding to anything. Mohammed addressed the, the hotel part, and, yeah, and I yeah. hope that's clear. Yeah. And w we are trying to register as many people as possible uh, for the one-off time just for this COP from CSOs. Thanks so much for that. Um, Jennifer, do you have a microphone? Okay. For the green There we light. go. Come on. Um, and I, I'll be... Um, I'll be try and be brief because I want to hear some of the others because I I have to head out at eight. Um, but um, let me let me just respond a bit. I mean I think first of all um, great to hear about the plans on civil society. Great to hear that the prices will be there. Great to hear that that um, NGOs can demonstrate um, uh, that all of that is there. And and um, I think um, you all know what a priority that is for us as well. So that's. That's um, good to hear. Um, I think um, maybe just a little bit on the G7 to respond to some of that. So, and um, I've said this all also in other fora. I mean, I, I think I was asked, um, is the G7 enough? I said, no, it's not enough. I mean, I think there was some progress. I think that there were things that moved forward. But um, right now, if you look at where we are in a crisis, then obviously we need a more across across the board, and I think Christoph, um, yes, we absolutely need criteria. Um, we need input on the criteria. Um, I've been pretty clear that I would have wished that that part of the G7 outcome would have come out differently, um, and um, uh, but I think um, now what we have to do is define it. It's it's limited. Um, and I think those criteria on lock-in, the criteria on 1.5, the criteria, all of that ur urgently needs to be um, developed and uh, is being discussed and we need input into that, those conversations so that those are science-based. Science um, I think another piece on the sectoral commitments that you mentioned, I, I agree. I think. Um, and want to point, I'm sure you all know about, um, because there's a number of issues there. One, optimally, those sectoral commitments that countries made would be integrated into NDCs. And that could be part of your work program even, right? And then you would have more accountability across those voluntary commitments. Additionally, I think a uh, key process to watch is the, um, I have thing if I can remember the, the formal title, but the Secretary General's Task Force on Net Zero Commitments that is there. Catherine McKenna, the former Environment Minister from Canada, is working with an expert group to develop standards for those net zero corporate um, and city and state commitments, fundamental and accountability um, measures, and then looking at how to potentially have regulation around that. So I want to draw that. Uh, to everyone's attention. I think that's quite important also on these sectoral pieces. And optimally, I completely agree, Camilla, on the, on the um, industrial decarbonization and sectoral. I mean, that needs to drive, actually, to the zero, to the 1.5 consistency. And that, if the clubs, you know, I think that's one of the key goals and one of the key, uh, if, you know, working to deliver on that in an open way, and just to say here clearly also with our my Egyptian um, colleagues, that that is to be open. That is now the consultations are not, it's not a G7, it's an open um, initiative, even though the word club doesn't really make one think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the intent, so. Um, 
And I guess um, I think the jet P's are very important. The link to the club is really just a decarbonization of the power sector, which would then um, help meeting different criteria. But the jet P's are really focused on coal phase out. They're focused on scaling up renewables in those countries um, right now. And I, I think it's fundamental that they're credible and move forward. And then I guess um, maybe just um, a final um, thought is on the equity point. I mean, it's absolutely fundamental, right? And I think um, um, we agree that the attention to adaptation to loss and damage needs to be scaled up. I think Germany has worked. We can do more. We should do more, but work to contribute um, um, to all of that um, in the different funds, et cetera. Um, but, but we know that, I mean, it can't, if we, um, that if we don't get enhancement of NDCs as countries had uh, committed to do, I mean, we won't get there. We won't get there. And yes, there needs to be support, but also we're now at a moment where investments by Germany and other countries have driven down the costs of renewables exceedingly. And we see from the IPCC that countries are better off uh, economically and socially and health-wise if they go for 1.5 degree pathway forward. And so I, I just want to challenge that. That's a big priority for us as well and all the diplomacy we're doing is that we see um, and, and engage um, and, and also you know, ask questions about you know, build out of coal in different countries, et cetera, because I think without that, we don't get there. And then those countries are also responsible on an equity side of things. So it's not just a north-south issue. I think it's, it's more complex. And uh, so I just wanted to bring that into the room at all. Let me stop there. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so to my esteemed panelists, I'm going to ask you to take your seats over there. That's because we, I want to play some videos uh, and it will be more comfortable for you to watch. We're coming back and we'll, we'll do that then. <laughs> oh, you're not off the hook, Ambassador. Um, all right, so we're going to watch some videos now. We've got some interventions coming through, just as you would see at, at a summit. Uh, we have some voices coming in. And the first video, uh, let me just make sure I have that correctly. Uh, will be coming to us from a country in Africa called Benin. Let's watch that. Hello, my name is Safia Tu Nana. Uh, we are here in Gamfier in uh, Benin. Uh, as you can see, we are in a community that is living on the water and uh, the effects of, of climate change have really been um, experienced here in this community uh, with the rising level of the sea and um, pe people struggling to access you know uh, more fishes for their consumption and also of course the electricity access uh, which is really uh, crucial for the development of all communities and uh, we can see that um, recently the um, Effects of climate change um, are really impacting communities like this one in Ganvier. Uh, so we need a lot of uh, efforts, more efforts and actions towards um, lowering uh, the increase of temperature um, and also uh, more uh, means of adaptation for communities like the one in Ganvier here and other communities um, uh, across Africa. And of course, uh, civil society has a big role to play in, in this um, fight against climate change. We need um, a synergy of actions between uh, African CSOs and European CSOs. I mean, a global um, network that comes together and really uh, push forward uh, the actions towards uh, the climate change fight. We really need you um, from all level of positions, from all um, aspects uh, of societies. Uh, we need your contribution on a daily basis. Think about climate change and act uh, towards preserving communities from the damage of climate change surrounding us. Thank you.
a call for solidarity from Benin. Our next video will come to us from Ghana. Now we're feeling the effects of the climate change. The question is that what are the world powers or world leaders doing about this climate change? We know that uh, the effects of the current state of the climate is as, as a result of uh, uh, the activities of the super countries of the world. If you look at the rising waves and tides that are destroying and coming into homes and everything. If you look at the uh, biomass and the ecology of the marine waters, it's almost you know, down to zero. The artisanal fishery or the small scale fishery is a way of like taking care of so many like, uh, uh, the vast uh, number of the population and therefore we cannot afford to let it you know, uh, go the way it is going. So our appeal to the uh, advanced countries is to have a critical look at how fossil fuel and its emissions and how toxic waste for factories and all are handled. I would also would want these leaders to be able to tell us, uh, be able to come out clear to tell us uh, what they intend doing what they have done so far to address these issues. So as a matter of urgency, we are appealing to uh, the leaders uh, who are part of the signatures to this Paris Agreement to quickly come to our rescue because things look very bad. Things look very, very bad for artisanal fishery in West Africa, especially in Ghana. Thank you. Right. Ordinary people that are experiencing the extraordinary and they're asking questions, uh, they're demanding answers from their leaders. Uh, we now have uh, one contribution uh, that is going to be here in person and I'd like to invite uh, Patricia Boland uh, to come over uh, and make her uh, statement. She is from the Action for Climate Empowerment and Participation. Thank you, and uh, just to say, my intervention will be a bit more UN-style intervention compared to the videos we had before, so you should be used to it. And also, we would love to have more interventions in the middle, as you know, and not at the very end of all conferences. Um, so thank you, Excellencies. Thank you, Christiane Averbeck, in the name of the Climate Alliance, for this invitation. Climate decision-making needs to be participatory, inclusive, and accessible. The IPCC 6 assessment report highlighted the importance of participatory decision-making to build climate resilience. Civil society, and in particular African feminists, are ready to participate at COP27 to bring in important perspectives, expertise, and showcase just solutions. For COP27, participation, inclusivity, and accessibility are not only procedural, logistical, and organizational questions as we have heard. As COP27 presidency, you have the opportunity to lead parties to agree on a human rights-based action plan for action for climate empowerment, also known as ACE. Why so? Because the right to environmental education, the right to access to information, and the right to public participation are internationally recognized human rights. How so? The ACE Action Plan should respond to children's and youth's important role in climate action. Children represent almost one third of the world's population. The climate crisis poses an immense and unprecedented threat to their presence already and to their future, and also the future of the unborn. In recent years, it has been acknowledged that children and youth are change makers through their protests and drawing the eyes of the world on the climate crisis. Their trust is almost lost 
because children and youth are frequently overlooked when it comes to developing legislation, policies and programs to contact climate change, and they don't see sufficient action COP after COP. The ACE Action Plan establishes the framework for the development of national climate learning strategies for all. Indeed, many adults and elderly people might need climate education more than children and youth. Education programs developed need to be gender transformative and enable skills for sustainable development and build capacities for civic engagement, activism and on rights, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, and ensure that civil society is meaningfully engaged in the development of these strategies. The action plan should also recognize the need to protect effectively environmental defenders to show parties' commitment to ensure the protection of the rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and association, access to information and participation as essential parts of the convention. Environmental defenders, often indigenous, and their communities must not be subjected to criminalization, intimidation, harassment, or assassination. People power, climate justice. Thanks so much for that, uh, Christiane. And I'd like to now invite my panelists back to take your places. It's now time for Q&A. Uh, we're going to open the floor for questions. Do you have to, you've, you, you, you know what, you've stayed the course. Thanks so much for that. We really appreciate it. Uh, Jennifer Morgan's got to go. Thank you. <laughs> you guys do remember we didn't start at 8 o'clock sharp, so we're, we're going to go a little bit over. Um, we want our time back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so it's now time for Q&A. Uh, anybody got a question? Uh, any questions, any follow-ups, right? And let's keep them questions and not so much statements so we can get as many as we can. So the gentleman over there. And tell us who you are and who you would like to have your, answer I your do. question. Thank you very much. And thank you for this opportunity to put like questions here. Uh, my name is Tilman Ziel. I'm from the Network of Future, Future Justice. And yes, I put this question before. And we have this wonderful title here, The Road to COP27. And I wonder how many of us will go by bike, by public transport. Yeah, and that's the question. How is actually the road to COP27 sustainable? Like from the European perspective, how is it like possible for the activists and everybody of us to not go by flight, but lead by example and go to the COP27 in a sustainable way? Also, maybe uh, I want to encourage you also to ask the commission directly to find a common solution, to find common solution for a sustainable COP. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Do we have any more questions? Right. Hello, my name is Lisa Jörg. I work for Action Against Hunger. My question is, of course, about hunger, the current hunger crisis. Um, 828 million people are roughly uh, yeah, going to bed hungry in the world today. Um, what's the plan at the COP in Sharm el Sheikh to address this issue? Will there be a food day? Will there be thoughts about how we can transform and transition food systems to be more fair and sustainable and not just look at energy? So I'm really curious to hear what is planned there. Thank you. Okay, why don't we deal with these two questions now and anything that comes after that we'll pick up. Okay, so two questions, the road to, to COP and, and food. So who wants to do road to COP? We'll take it. But we'll start with food. Let's start with food because yes. you're ready to do that. Yes, um, uh, thank you. And, and it is important to highlight, I mean, the rest of the picture. I mean, uh, as I said before, we broke out to, uh, to, to hear the, um, uh, the videos. Um, we, we as presidency did two things. One is the normal presidency thing by identifying thematic days. And the other one, that in Glasgow, we identified 17 topics of interest that we thought that they are of interest to the wider uh, community and the international community in general. Let me just share with you like the topics of the 17, um, uh, of those 17 issues of interest. Um, they range from uh, waste, just energy transition, just financing, sustainable cities, sustainable transport, climate resilient agriculture, 
nutrition ecosystems and um, uh, and and um, uh, and oceans, um, um, new, uh, decent life for all, um, um, uh, um, and and then we have uh, adaptation in water and others. So those um, are 17 topics, and most what we are, what we are doing now or what we did is that we started preparing concept notes in each one of these that are not Egypt focus or Africa focus but better on the on the global level we are working with the UN system on each and one of them to identify what are the deliverables and the other initiatives that do exist in the like in the international community or in the multilateral system in general so we are capturing what is there what has been achieved what are the challenges and trying to work on deliverables under each one of those topics if they evolve and we get a lot of traction then they will evolve into initiative with clear deliverables um, added to them um, in, the, in a later stage uh, because of the crises, we have hydrogen is one of the, the items that we have identified as a potential energy source for future. And decarbonization, which has been being now being used as like a very important uh, component. On the thematic days, we did uh, prepare um, the list of like the program of the presidency on the thematic days. That has, of course, the normal finance and um, and adaptation and uh, water, but it also has and, and energy, but it also has biodiversity. It also has uh, ACE. So we have a focus day on ACE. We have a focus day on gender. We have a focus day on uh, youth and future generations, and we have a focus day on decarbonization, and we have a focus day on solutions. So those are days that complement the, the negotiating track that we all know of, which with the, with the 120, 130 decisions coming out. But in parallel to that, with the different stakeholders, we are working on uh, the presidency team, but also with the champions team, where we had Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen. He is um, one of the very well-known international figures when it comes to financing development and financing SDGs. Uh, he was chosen as a champion for Egypt to deal with the, with the issue of a climate championship because he has the sense of the cross-cutting approach to, um, to development. So he has a sense of how can we do this with a social impact, positive social impact, how can we do the climate uh, with a very good economic impact. So the bigger picture that we want to put forward is that in addition to the negotiations, which is a very difficult process, uh, with, takes years to have things moving through, we have the initiatives that are there, the topics, plus, of course, other initiatives like methane and others. And we have the thematic days where we have the focus discussions. Responding to the question on food, yes, we have two initiatives that we have identified. We have one on nutrition and another one on agriculture. And on the thematic day on, ag on adaptation and agriculture, our focus there will be the food systems. Um, starting from uh, resilient agriculture to enhancing uh, food productivity to dealing with the food value chain from production all the way to consumption, dealing with the uh, reducing losses in this value chain, dealing with the cooling of, uh, of agricultural production, which is a very important component that, that, that causes a lot of emissions. So all of these elements, we are trying to mobilize as many partners as we can so it becomes a well-defined initiative with clear deliverables. If it does not evolve to this level, it will be a side event or a panel discussion that focuses on those items. So on food, I can answer that. On how to reach uh, Egypt by, by, by a bicycle from here, I cannot answer that. I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm sure that anybody who takes an airplane, he can, they can always like be carbon neutral. They can uh, buy the, the emissions, and this is always in the, in the system. Uh, we are, what we are committed to is we, we want to, to, have, to have the conference center and the whole process carbon neutral. This is something that we, that, that we are working on. Um, sustainability and, and everything there, and we are doing our best to make um, Sharm el Sheikh a green city and a sustainable city. Um, and um, to give an example, and, and I hope we will be successful in that. And I have to say, it is not an easy task, even for a small city like Sharm el Sheikh. It is a developing country. It has a lot of private sector, but but uh, the government is doing its best from from all the different entities. I'll stop there. Yes, um, just to the last point, um, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a, a more and more a serious issue for many people who want to attend the COP, how can they do this in a sustainable way? And it was possible in, uh, for many of us in Glasgow that there was a, a train to Glasgow, and we even went to Marrakesh by train, and there was a train organized in this regard. 
um, we, we as John Watch, we check, tried to check out of, or find a way how we can do this for Egypt. Um, we looked at the ship from Genoa and so on, but it was, we, we didn't find a solution so far. Um, and uh, I think it would be really good to think together with you um, uh, to ask different providers whether there is a pop option, how we can make this happen. I, um, um, I think many are asking us um, to to look for this, and thank you. We would, be, would love to be part of the sustainable tour. <coughs> um, thank you. And m maybe I could answer for one question of you regarding the equity issue, because I think I felt touched by this. Um, uh, I think if we don't get an equitable solution, we will get no solution for the climate crisis. But um, I want to ask you really one serious or two serious questions about this. One is, um, wouldn't we need, let's say, a dynamic interpretation of common but differentiated responsibility? So we have the criteria in the, in the, in the convention, um, responsibility and capability, um, and the world is changing. So um, if you look to China as an example, it's um, now even for historic emissions, it's soon will have been more than Europe. Um, then, w and for uh, some of the oil countries, it's already long the case that this is. Uh, um, so I um, just think, um, forgetting the acceptance in our countries, it's it's in, it's important to think about the dynamic of the interpretation of the criteria. And the second point, um, we shouldn't lock in developing countries in the old thinking that it is the cheaper way to do it with fossil fuels. This is usually not any longer the case. Of course, they need support to, to shift in the other direction, but um, this is not mainly financial support now. It's buying down the risk and things like this, And um, but it's, um, uh, I think if we lock them in to be slower in the next industrial revolution, the decarbonization, they again will be the loser because they are sl slower. And we must help them to be faster and um, to get this understanding of equity as part of the structure. And I just um, want to understand, because I felt that you have a very, let's say, a, a really serious wish that it is equity, no? and whether you feel that that is a thing for, for discussing. <coughs> No, I'm, I'm glad you followed up on that uh, to clarify because either there's a misunderstanding or a disagreement, so let me clarify it. Um, of developing countries, China is one exception. So I'm not talking about China, I'm not talking about an oil-rich company, I'm talking about the 130 other members of the G77 in China who are uh, completely impoverished and who uh, are suffering and feeling left behind. And I meant it more in the context of don't let people feel that their adaptation needs don't matter. That's when I was uh, referring to the issue of the mitigation centric. It should by no means be interpreted as asking for slower or lesser mitigation work. I'm just saying, please don't forget that fisherman in Ghana or the young lady in Benin. That's what we mean by equity and it equitable global approach to, uh, to the issue. Uh, on the finance side, and, and, and I mean, as you rightly said, yes, China is responsible for a large amount of emissions, but I worry a little bit by using it as an example because Egypt, which is a country of 110 million people, is responsible for 0.6 of 1% of global emissions. So you can take that as a benchmark and imagine that every African country is a fraction of what Egypt is, barring perhaps South Africa and maybe, and I don't know, Ethiopia and, and the comparable population. So I'm just saying that the overwhelming percentage of developing countries in Asia, in South America, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and in Africa have historically and currently very little responsibility there. And uh, 
you're absolutely right on the point that leapfrogging has to be the approach when it comes to emissions. Absolutely, no one would be uh, wise, I mean, uh, silly enough to propagate, you know, going the old path unless absolutely necessary. But the financial support is key for all of that. So, uh, and, and you said we need to help them. And that's, that's the key word that shows we're in agreement, that we need to help them. And help equals equity in my book. That means, and you don't, and we were talking about the 100 billion and others, no one expects anyone to come up to go to their treasury and say, okay, we need a trillion dollars next year to, to provide developing countries. That's not going to happen. But it, empathy goes a long way. Showing that you are listening and cognizant of the suffering of this or that community and trying to help genuinely goes a long way. So, so I think we're on the same page in that sense and in agreement on that. But I, I just wanted to clarify where I was coming from on, on the notion of equity. Um, thank you very much. And maybe uh, um, starting with the equity point, I found it quite interesting to see how the common but differentiated responsibility and capability uh, evolved over time th since from 1992. It was part of the UNFCCC until today. And you see that reflected also in the regime changes, let's say Kyoto style to Paris style. And I like your differentiation. It's not one block and one block anymore. The world has changed in this time, and we have to have this differentiated look. And in this context, we just heard from these interventions, and we can read it in the IPCC that climate change is now felt in every region in the world, and the most vulnerable countries are those who cannot adapt also for their socioeconomic structures, and that are typically the developing countries. And I very much liked your idea, um, Christoph, in the context with loss and damage. Why not see if there is a certain dynamic which is not yet fully integrated in the regime in Sharm El Sheikh to make a pledge for a certain amount of money for certain countries where we show specific support. So I, I think to work towards that goal can be very interesting in this context. Um, secondly, on the question to the road <laughs> to Sharm El Sheikh, I really like that question. And obviously, uh, Christoph already mentioned that there were approaches to go by train, by boat, by whatever, and it's particularly difficult in this context if you think from a European perspective. It always depends on where you're coming from, right? We even had an initiative back in 2007 to go to Bali on public transport and train and stuff. In the end, it, we failed, so it didn't work out, but we were even taking holidays, and I think it could have been a marvelous endeavor being on the climate train together for a week, driving, teaching each other. So I think it's also an opportunity to rethink travel, what you do with the time when you commute. It's not only about the most time, you know, the quickest way to go there. So um, in this context, let's think creatively. Furthermore, consider that there is, I don't think face-to-face -face meetings can be replaced by by um, virtual things, but I do believe that part of the engagement outside the negotiations could do so, and we as an organization will do so, not travel, like for example, I, and on, and I see you're getting nervous with time, but let me say one thing on food, then just on, so hands on. It's a challenge. I like that you refer to food systems. We have to think of food systems. That's important. And, but let's make it an example, how to inspire people. What about the food at the COP? What do we actually offer the people to rethink how we nourish ourselves and what options there are to get the nutrients you need in different ways but steak? Um, I think there are a lot of examples you can showcase the future by having people feel it, eat it, see it. I think that might be something for the presidency to consider. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I, so. Okay, so I, I think this is a fair place to leave it. Uh, I, I really would have loved more time to spend with all of you and to take more questions from the audience, but um, 
we have used up all of our time. I know that you all have to, to head off now onto, onto your other business, but I just want to take the opportunity to thank you. Um, I won't say much on that because I want to invite uh, Dr. Abba back, uh, back to, to really thank you for, for, for this. We did have another video planned. It will be short and quick, but perhaps we'll do this as, as we're filing out, and those that can really stay uh, will stick around to do that. So thank you so much uh, to my panelists. Thank you. I would love to mention you all by name, but I really appreciate your input. Uh, this has really been refreshing. Uh, and I really hope that we'll have some implementation uh, at COP27. Uh, so, Dr. Averbeck, I know you've got something that you would like to present. Uh, you can do that now. Talking about something to eat, we had actually millions of creatures who collected something for us, and this is honey. So I hope uh, that uh, I think it's a mammoth task to organize uh, the COP27, but thank you so much for being here and something sweet for you. <laughs> thank you. It helps you to remain strong Thank you so much, Camilla. <laughs> you addressed the issue of food. And Christoph, thank you. And last not least, also to our friend, Christine. Thank you for, Moran. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this time with us and discussing uh, the road to Sham El Sheikh. And now, but before uh, we go to Egypt, I would like to invite you for a glass of wine or water. And. And some burrito. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to thank my colleagues, uh, Christiane and Julia and Lena, who've organized all this. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Gabriel Klaassen, and I'm an intersectional justice activist from South Africa, which basically means that I look at more than just the environment, I look at the social and the economic just as much, because I understand that they don't work in one silo, but rather that they intersect, and that we need to look at them intersecting, otherwise we as people cannot find intersections in our global solidarity. I've had the deepest pleasure with a colleague of mine to have traveled to Germany in the last month where we engaged with quite a few of our peers, people from different age demographics, different backgrounds, different job professions, and tried to understand them a little bit better and what their understanding of the justice movement is. And one thing stood clear is that there's a deep want for solidarity. There's a deep want for, especially because COP is on this continent, on the African continent this year, for us to elevate the voices, for us to elevate the African youth perspective when it comes to what is needed from our leaders. And that is specifically adaptation and mitigation, not one or the other being pinned against each other. We need them in unison. But we also need, and this is something that needs to be at the top of our agenda at COP27 this year, loss and damage. We cannot afford to keep playing with the lives of those most affected, saying, oh, but technically it's not a requirement, it's not a, it's not a need. It is a need. It is a must that finances for loss and damages gets put on the agenda. That strategy for how we move forward and recover from loss and damages are put on the agenda for discussion, not only for that, but for implementation as well. We need it. We cannot adapt to loss and damages. We cannot mitigate to loss and damages. We can only hope that we recover and that we recover with everyone standing beside us. <laughs>